Hello, my name is Abe Weitzberg. I'm a resident of Woodland Hills and a member of the SSFL Community Advisory Group. Today I will present some information taken from publicly available documents that has not been widely disseminated and which may give a perspective that differs substantially from what is widely believed in local communities. I worked on reactors at SSFL from 1962 to 1965 for Atomics International. I am a practicing nuclear engineer and expert in many of the technical disciplines related to the prior SSFL operations and the current cleanup discussion. My goal is to provide factual information to help the community achieve a protective cleanup. By way of introduction, the SRE accident occurred in July 1959 when pump fluid leaked into primary reactor coolant, creating a sticky residue. Loss of coolant circulation caused overheating of the fuel rods, and the steel cladding in 13 of 43 fuel rods melted, forming a low melting point alloy with from 1 to 2 percent of the uranium metal fuel. Radioactivity leaked into the coolant and was contained within the reactor. The reactor was shut down. Some radioactive gases were released to the air. Eventually, contaminated sodium coolant was shipped to the Hanford Washington Reservation after the facility was cleaned. The reactor building was not designed as a containment pressure vessel simply because the maximum credible accident would not release enough gas volume to require pressure containment. Instead, it was designed how to retain gases at about atmospheric pressure and to reduce diffusion leakage of potentially contaminated gas. Subsequent to the accident, the facility was cleaned and refurbished. A new core and new sodium coolant were loaded and the reactor continued operation successfully from 1960 to 1964. It was decontaminated in early 1970s, released for unrestricted use, and used generally for storage. In 1999, the SRE facility was completely removed. Although there have been loud and persistent claims that the accident released large amounts of harmful radiation to the environment, this report, published in November 1959, provides data that refutes those claims. This report, as well as all SRE reports, were unclassified and widely distributed and made available to anybody who was interested in seeing them. The report contains data from the Environmental Monitoring Program that had been in place at Santa Susana since 1954. Besides on-site locations, the program sampled soil and vegetation at about 40 locations within a 10-mile radius, from Rosita Boulevard to Moore Park. The program measured alpha radiation as would be seen from plutonium and uranium and beta and gamma radiation as would be seen from iodine, cesium, and strontium, which are known to come from radioactive fission products from weapons testing as well as possibly from terrestrial reactor accidents. A continuous air monitor was also operated at the same time. The measurements, as will be shown later, clearly were sensitive enough to show the effects of weapons testing, whether they occurred at the U.S. Nevada test site or in Russia. Although it may be difficult to see in this video, this slide shows the results taken from 1958 to 1959. The top plot shows beta-gamma samples from vegetation. The second shows beta-gamma from the soil. The third shows alpha radiation from the soil, and the fourth shows alpha radiation from vegetation. The peaks are known to correspond to either known weapons testing activities or periods of heavy rainfall at Santa Susana, which precipitated weapons product out of the environment. It can be seen that in July 59, there is no obvious increase in radiation, either alpha or beta gamma, from the SRE accident in comparison to what was already being observed from the weapon testing activity. For those of you who may want to look at the details, the information contained here is also in briefings that are shown on the CAG website or can be seen in the reference reports that appear on the CAG website, the DOE website, the DTSE website, and others. This chart shows environmental air activity in the vicinity of the SRE reactor from July 1958 through August and September 59. Again, there is no increase in environmental air activity at the time of the SRE accident. 
It appears that the SRE operations have not been responsible for the release of significant quantities of radiation to the environment, at least above that normally accompanying periods of rainfall or fallout from the nuclear test. There's an obvious question. If it is agreed that 1-2% to of the fuel melted, what happened to the fission products contained in the fuel? Fortunately, that during the cleanup of the SRE accident, there was detailed examination of the core debris, the reactive vessel, and the entire balance of plant system. Results became widely available in the document published in 1962. Additional fission product information was made available at the DOE SRE workshop in 2009. It had been confirmed by experiments at the metal fueled experimental breeder reactor in Idaho that the uranium triiodide non-volatile compound was formed so that much of the iodine was retained in the fuel. This 1962 report, which is also unclassified as I stated before, contains the results of the examination of SRE and shows where fission products were seen in the system. The document contains this introduction, which is important to help explain why the fission products behaved as they did. One of the unique qualities of the sodium-cooled reactors with respect to radiological safety is the potential fission product retention ability of the coolant. Principal factors providing this ability are the occurrence of chemical reactions between the coolant and the certain fission products leading to less volatile compounds, such as the sodium iodide, mechanical trapping nature of the liquid coolant for particular fission products in general, maintenance of a coolant pool above the core in sodium reactors, even with the postulation of severe reactor accidents, ensures the continued effectiveness of this capacity. Where were the fission products found in the SRE system? Briefly summarized, there were appreciable deposition of fission product contamination throughout the primary system. A marked selectivity was evident in this process, with strontium, cerium, and a obium zirconium deposition being much greater than that of cesium or iodine. A gamma spectrum scan on September 14th of a cover gas sample identified the principal remaining contributions as xenon-133 and krypton-85. Note, there was no evidence of iodine. An August 11 analysis of a sample of sodium coolant showed the presence of iodine and cesium and the absence of strontium. Since the melting temperature of strontium is only slightly lower than the peak recorded SRE fuel temperature of 1,465 degrees Fahrenheit, most strontium would have remained a solid and not moved with a liquid or vaporized. The SRE accident bottom line, whether you call it a partial meltdown or an accident, is very straightforward. There was no evidence of cesium or iodine outside of the SRE sodium coolant. There was no evidence of strontium except in the primary SRE piping. And the only evidence from SRE gaseous release was the krypton and the xenon. On the other side of the coin, there was plenty of evidence of environmental dispersion, strontium or cesium from weapons testing. It is a reasonable conclusion that any strontium or cesium at SSFL at that time did not come from the SRE accident. The SRE accident is irrelevant to the SSFL cleanup, except for the unwarranted fear it engendered in the neighboring community. Thank you.